Okay, so we're going to talk today about hearing tests in children. So pediatrics. I'll just move this. All right, so um, an auditory response. A small child doesn't respond to acoustic stimulus thresholds. The sounds have to be really clear to them. So a small child, it's not going to respond at its at its threshold, its lowest level of hearing, what you're going to end up collecting is the minimum response level from the child. And this is the lowest level of a response that a child gives to an acoustic stimuli that is consistent. And um, depending on a variety of circumstances, this minimum response level might be barely audible to the child or well above the threshold. So when we're working with small children, we're not necessarily going to get their threshold it could be a hard concept for, you know, a child to understand that there's a sound and they have to respond. Um, so we get the minimum response level. We get the best that we can. Speech and language are imitative processes, and they are acquired through auditory sense. If a person or infant cannot hear, the child will not learn language. So hearing comes first. You have to be able to hear to learn spoken language. Any hearing deficit will interfere with development. Before newborn hearing screening, children were not identified with hearing loss until they were three years old when they were well behind their peers in language, okay? So if you cannot hear, then you will not learn spoken language. Hearing is so important for language. So the reason infants with hearing loss before newborn hearing screening weren't identified until later is because um, all infants with hearing loss, they do babble. But the difference is children with normal hearing around six months notice that their coos come from their own mouths and then they begin to amuse themselves by varying the rate, the pitch, and the loudness by lolling. So all babies babble. Babies with hearing loss babble. What happens though is children who hear normally start to notice that these sounds are coming out of their mouths and then they start to have fun with the sounds and they, they create them and they develop them and the sounds become longer streams. Children with hearing impairment don't receive auditory feedback and they gradually decrease their vocalization. So Kids that can, the babies that can hear okay, first off, they have fun playing with these sounds. And then second, they're auditorily reinforced. So if a baby goes ba, 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 and the mom goes bottle, do you want your bottle, your ba, ba, your bottle, the child is encouraged to continue vocalizing. Now the adult would do the same for the child with hearing loss. The difference is, that the child with hearing loss may not understand the parent's feedback. So like I said, children with normal hearing go into later stages of echolalia and they begin to string sounds and words together. The earlier in life a child with hearing loss is identified, the greater the chance of successful rehabilitation. It is so important to identify and treat hearing loss at an early, early age. Infants are born with billions of neurons in their brains. And what happens is, is as they get stimulated, the neurons make connections and they prune themselves and they connect and they prune and they connect. So if an infant's brain isn't stimulated auditorily, that area of the brain is going to be taken over by another area. The brain isn't going to let the auditory cortex sit idly. And if sounds aren't coming in to make these connections, it's going to be much harder later on as the brain sets or is done to learn a language. So for any of you that are fortunate enough to be spoken two languages as an infant, I am sure you have no problem speaking two languages as an adult, even if years went by where you never heard that second language because your brain had made the connections with the second language. So if a brain 
isn't able to make the connection for hearing early on, there are going to be lifelong difficulties ahead. So we have testing at birth because there is evidence that the hearing loss will be detected earlier than it would be without screening. We have follow-up diagnostic tests after screening failure, and we have um, diagnosis and treatments available. So infant screening. Infant screening really like the world was changed by newborn hearing screening in 1996 um, because now we don't have to, we know very early on if a child has hearing loss. A hearing loss is found in one out of 50 infants from the NICU. Hearing loss is one of the number one birth defects. Hearing loss is rather common. I'm not talking about necessarily total, severe to profound bilateral hearing loss. I mean a unilateral hearing loss, a moderate hearing loss. Hearing loss is very common. So before newborn hearing screening, they still use this, the APGAR system, where an infant is evaluated at birth in one, five, and 10 minutes after birth for their appearance, basically their color, their pulse, their grimace, their activity level, and their respiration. Uh, it's, it's a well-known test called the APGAR. And the scores are evaluated, and they're ranked from 0 to 10, and it's done at 1, 5, and 10 minutes. Like I said, we have respiratory effect, muscle tone, heart rate, color, reflex, and irritability. The APGAR helps, <coughs> excuse me, helps to determine which children need oxygen, whether there's a likelihood of central nervous system damage. Children with low APGAR scores are more likely to be in the NICU, and they are more likely to have sensory neural hearing loss. So back in 1994, before newborn hearing screening, there was a joint committee that developed the high-risk registry for hearing loss in addition to children with low APGAR scores. And the infants were separate, the neonates were separated on risk factors from birth to 28 days and then from infancy through early childhood. So they gave a list of indicators that might be suspected, if a child has these indicators, they might be suspected of having hearing loss. Um, but the, the list missed a lot, of, a lot of infants because hearing loss is recessive in nature. For the most part, genetic hearing loss comes from a recessive gene. So parents who could have, I have normal hearing, my husband has normal hearing, our parents, our siblings, everyone has normal hearing, how, did we, how does our child have a hearing loss? Well, the infant is born with the hearing loss because hearing loss comes from a recessive gene and it's a rather common recessive gene. I believe about a third of the population carries this recessive gene. So if we have a class of 25 students, almost a third of everybody in this class, so like eight students, eight to nine of you students, have this recessive gene for hearing loss. So who was on the Joint Committee? ASHA was on the Joint Committee, the American Academy of Audiology, the American Academy of Otolaryngology, head of neck surgery, and directors of speech and hearing programs in state and welfare agencies. So they came together in 1994 to put together these high-risk factors, and then they came together in 2000 and endorsed the goal of universal newborn hearing screening. And today, it is in every state, it is state-mandated that every infant, before they leave the hospital, must have their hearing screened. Okay, so every infant prior to leaving their hospital has to have they're hearing screened. The idea behind universal newborn hearing screening is that it is cost effective. It is cheaper for the governments, for our state and local governments, and the federal government to identify hearing loss in an infant and treat it than for it to be identified at age three or four years old and have to play catch up. Okay, so every infant is screened. Identifying hearing loss at birth 
saves the government like hundreds of thousands of dollars in special education costs down the road. They still maintain the high-risk registry too. So newborn hearing screening has been very, very successful, but it's not perfect. Nothing is ever perfect. And sometimes infants who fail the screening don't receive appropriate follow-up. So you know that the new parents are given a certificate that says, you know, um, your, your child referred. We don't say fail. We don't want to uh, scare anybody because it does still have a high false positive rate. So the certificate will say your child referred the newborn hearing screening. Please bring your child back for a full hearing evaluation. And sometimes parents don't bring their child back. So in that case, the child would sort of be lost until a pediatrician identified it or a nurse, <coughs> I'm sorry, a nursery school identified it. Some children might pass the newborn hearing screening, but then have a type of hearing loss that is hereditary and degenerative. So they might have hearing when they're a one month old, but then gradually lose their hearing as they age. So that's another issue that you know parents have to be aware of and pediatricians and schools. So when children, when infants leave the hospital, they get a certificate uh, that says, your baby can hear. So if the baby passes the hearing screen, the certificate says, congratulations, your baby can hear. But it basically says, your baby can hear for now. Okay? And it gives a list of um, milestones that an infant should reach with their speech and language. And it says, you know, if your infant doesn't meet these milestones, please bring the infant back for a follow-up hearing evaluation. So the high-risk registry, it still exists for neonates, includes a family history of congenital or delayed onset sensory neural hearing loss, Utero infections, including rubella and herpes, craniofacial abnormalities, abnormal pinnas in the ear canal, low birth weight, hyperbilirubinia is excessive blood in the uh, <laughs> excessive amounts of certain blood in the bile, ototoxic medications, medications that are toxic to the ear, bacterial meningitis. Bacterial meningitis is an infection that it not only can, um, you know, kill someone, it's an infection of the brain and it can enter the ear and harden the cochlea. A very low APGAR score, prolonged <coughs> mechanical ventilation, and findings with a syndrome known to include sensory neural hearing loss or conduct.